first of all, I would like to thank you all very much for being here, Tom and Jean-Paul, of course, in Verbier. Uh, the dream was that we would, most of us, be here, but there were several things that stood in the way, like today the snow and, of course, the pandemic. Um, but that doesn't mean that we cannot have a great virtual debate for our virtual platform. I would like to hand over to Jean-Paul, who is the moderator of this debate and who invited you all to attend the 2021 summit. Thank you again. Thank you, Annelie. Well, we will talk with uh, four people. There is the Swiss artist Claudia Conte. She is in the studio in the region of uh, Basel. Hello, Claudia. Uh, I remember the, the first time I worked with Claudia is, um, wow, uh, maybe is 10, 10 years ago. And I decided to invite also an, uh, another person, uh, um, a specialist of environment, uh, is uh, Tom Batin. He's here with me in, in Verbier now. Tom, you are a teacher, professor at the EPFL. And uh, you work also for Alpol. We'll talk about that. It's a special center in Sion, in Valis. I invited Madeleine Shipley. Madeleine, you are in Zurich. Uh, you, were, you are now head of visual art department at Progressia. And uh, you are the former director of Kunsthaus Arau. We work, when I was in Paris at the Centre Cultural Suisse, we work together on a special exhibition like Miriam Kahn, I remember, a beautiful artist. And Eddie Graber, you are also in Zurich. Hello, Eddie. And uh, I remember I was with Eddie at the university. It was in 19 something like that. Uh, before the... It was in the um, 80s, to be honest. Yeah, in the 80s, okay. <laughs> before the breakdown of the wall in Berlin. It's an old story, but well, uh, you are now, and from a lot of years, uh, director of the Pourcent Culturel Migro. You, it's, uh, the, I think it's the largest private cultural support in Switzerland. Uh, you, you will talk about that. And for my part, I'm now director of an uh, art school in Valis. The EDEA is one of the three art schools in the uh, French part of Switzerland. And before, I was co-director of the Centre Culturel Suisse, Swiss Cultural Center in Paris, who is an, um, uh, one part of Prolvesia for France. <coughs> well, I, I will uh, begin this debate with Claudia, the artist before. We are in a Verbi Art Summit. I actually come from uh, Switzerland, a very small village uh, near Lausanne, where I, where I grew up, uh, surrounded by nature and trees and forests and, and animals. And this very much influenced my, my work uh, of today. And um, I did the art school in Lausanne, Ecal. Uh, and after my time in, in Berlin and after having traveled a lot for different residencies as well for, with Brulvesia in, uh, in South Africa or in LA or I was in Rome as well for, uh, for a year at the Swiss Institute. So I've, after having um, moved a lot, I really felt uh, the need to come back to the, to the source meaning to come back to the, to the countryside. And uh, now, since, since a year, I'm in, the, um, I'm in the countryside near Basel, where, uh, where I bought a house, a self-sustainable house, and where I built my studio as well to produce my paintings and uh, woodwork. And um, yeah, I'm very happy in this surrounding because it feels um, more... Um, true to, to my very desire to be, to be close to nature. It's a house that is completely isolated, so we have no neighbors. The first neighbors are a kilometer away. Within my studio, we are looking for a way to, to calculate the carbon footprint of each of the, mainly the shows, so the project, which then um, uh, bring us to each of the, the sculpture or paintings. And by this, I think when we understand how uh, the work 
uh, or how much carbon footprint is produced, when and how, we can then understand how to reduce it. But obviously the main problem is the transport of the artwork, because in my case, I, I work very local with, with wood and sometimes with marble. And uh, Tom explained also the problem that uh, we have now uh, excavating those, uh, those mountains since more than 2000 years. And so the reality is that everything that we are doing live leave a footprint behind so that's that's a big worry is how to how to improve uh production and how to to do best and i think one of the key is the time really for example in terms of transport it's much better not to hurry a transport and have kind of slow motion transport than fast one for example uh, using hair freight um so that would be one idea. Obviously, now uh, having this house and studio here, it brings lots of um, uh, environmental question as well. And uh, my whole staff is more aware of, you know, not bringing plastic bottle, for example. We cannot use uh, paints that are uh, bad for the environment because everything goes uh, back into the soil here, since we are not linked, uh, uh, connected with the with the city or village or anything. Uh, we have the septic tank that is working directly with the with the house as well. So any product we are using, um, we have to be careful with. So I was already aware of that, but now it makes even more sense to 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 do the right um, move, really. And uh, another thing is that I'm planting trees uh, for each uh, sculpture I'm uh, I'm doing. I, I replant two two trees, so. I find ways like that, that just feels like a right place and the right thing to do to really protect what we can save still. And that's the, um, that's the main point, I guess, to try to really, yeah, really protect what's still here because we have lost so much already. Thank you, Claudia. Uh, I, I think we go now to Tom. Can you define the, the lines of work on your approach of this theme, of this debate? in your scientist work and your artistic work? Perhaps just to understand uh, historically of my background, I'm, I'm trained as a zoologist and uh, I'm trained as an ecologist, right? And uh, as we speak, I'm a professor at EPFL and uh, my studio, my lab is at EPFL. And soon, in a year from now, uh, with the EPFL Center for Alpine and Environmental uh, Alpine and Polar Environmental Research, it's the Alpol, in Sion, which is going to be an, a unique setting, highly interdisciplinary in nature, where uh, several uh, researchers or professors try to understand how the polar and how the alpine environment is changing today. Right, and uh, so we all understand that we are living in the Anthropocene, human-made. And so our job now is to kind of um, understand, to predict, to anticipate, and hopefully also to mitigate uh, what we have started so well, right? Uh, changing our world. And uh, so now being an environmental scientist, I try to understand the alpine environment, right? And uh, so we can see here around in Verbier, the alpine environment as beautiful as it can be. Uh, now it's snow covered, but if we remove the snow, we see the traces, right, that we left. So there are, there's infrastructure for various purposes, etc. So basically we left a kind of a footprint all around up to the highest uh, mountains worldwide. Um, you know, today we are aware that uh, microplastic we can find microplastics in the deepest ocean, as well as we find microplastics on the top of the Himalayan, right? On the Mount Everest, actually, right? So we all around, right? So it's time now uh, to sit down and, um, you know, what, try to understand how the environment works and try to understand, so what can we do? You know, what do we have to change, right? So how can we do it better, right? And uh, so this is basically my professional motivation. And uh, so here I'm working 
at something that at the first glance uh, you would ask yourself, so what the heck does this uh, have to do with the big picture? Uh, so in my lab, we work on the uh, biodiversity of the unseen, which are the microbes, bacteria, for instance. And uh, so we ask questions, for instance, what is the role of these bacteria in the uh, mountain streams? These are the guys right, that, basic, that basically orchestrate, that drive the biogeochemical cycles of our planet. Right? So when we talk about like, um, greenhouse gases, for instance, like carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, etc., most of this comes from microbial activities, right? So we need to understand what are the microbes out there so that we can understand indeed, right? So what are, what are, the, what are the implications of these microbes for the biogeochemistry? What are the implications of these microbes for the water to be clean? They purify the water so that we can drink the water, right? So understanding this better, Right? and training a new generation of future scientists, that's basically my motivation. Right? So, but I'm doing very fundamental, very basic research, and I'm extremely privileged that I'm able to do that. And uh, very often, so it's insightful driven. And uh, you know, whenever we start our journey, we never know what comes out. So we, we never know what the outcome is. And, and that's, that's really thrilling. That's very exciting. Mm -hmm. And that's also how discoveries are being made, for instance. So and there, <clears throat> I think it's important as a scientist to keep a kind of a, uh, a childish behavior to some extent, right? Because, and that brings me to art now. Right? It's not that artists are childish, I hope they are, to some extent. But what is important is the creativity, right? So artists are creative, and so are scientists, or so should scientists be, right? Uh, because uh, without this kind of seed of creativity, it's really hard to push frontiers hard, or to move behind frontiers, so to really advance science. Project, we, we try to find universal laws, basically, right? Whenever I see these landscapes, typically I have my camera with me, and I start taking pictures, right? And when I do so, I'm, I'm disappearing. I'm disappearing completely. I'm becoming part of the landscape in a very almost intimate uh, relationship with the landscape, and I'm, I'm start to breathe with the landscape. and. Um, for me, besides the science that I'm uh, doing, which is, of course, something, you know, it's, it's the brain that works there. And when I'm out there as a so-called photographer, it's another part of, of my personality, right, that works there. And I think it's very important for me to kind of converge these two sides or these two aspects of mine to well understand the environment. Thank you, Tom. Uh, uh, here now... Uh, two things between uh, Claudio and Tom, two, two words. It's one is slow. You talk about the slow, to, to be more slow, Claudio. And Tom, you talk about, in the beginning, sit down. Mm -hmm. It's time to sit down, mm -hmm. to think about, to, uh, I think, in reaction to productivity. Yeah. Because productivity is our society. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I'm as a director of an art school, the, the young artist, the young student, want to produce mm -hmm. is the, the other part. Um, now now I, I want to go to Zurich mm -hmm. to talk with Madeleine. Okay, thank you, Sean, for... Um, as a start, I would like briefly introduce Provetia and then um, attack the topics that you're bringing up. I mean, Proivetia is the Swiss Culture Foundation with the headquarter in Zurich. And uh, our goal is to promote and to disseminate Swiss art and culture and to stimulate international exchange. Uh, Proivetia has over 100 employees who work in Switzerland as well as uh, in our international offices spread more or less around the globe. And I'm there the head of the visual arts department where I'm responsible for all the projects and requests in the field of the visual arts as well as architecture. 
And together with my team, I'm also responsible for the Swiss contributions to the biennial of uh, Venice. And I would say in, in <laughs> issues uh, regarding uh, environment are uh, important for our work within the foundation and also for our collaboration with uh, partners. Within the organization, uh, there has been um, guidelines um, that have been uh, implemented. They define our behavior, our daily and our daily work. And the main focus um, at this stage is um, on traveling. And the goal is that the whole staff, of course, travels in a reduced and responsible way. Besides that, let me pick up two projects that are also closely linked to ecological questions. One is um, a program that we uh, had on last year. Uh, it it uh, was called Home Not Alone. And it's about staying at home, but being connected. And uh, one of the participants of the project was Serge Diakota uh, from Kinshasa. And the idea of the project uh, was to find a new way for our res residency programs for artists and exchanges for artists. And since traveling was still and still is not possible, the program tries to bring together artists that um, stay physically at home but are connected digitally um, among each other in a very intense way. The idea came up due to the COVID pandemic, of course, but it also has an ecological impact. It makes us um, think about building international networks without the necessity of uh, traveling. So that is quite a key issue to, um, to us. Another project I just want would like to mention is PolArts. It's a new instrument of the foundation, a call for proposal for interdisciplinary projects between art, science, and technology. Um, I think Tom and Claudia could uh, <laughs> maybe <laughs> hand in um, a project together for that. That would be perfect. And um, which is one of the supported projects recently is a collaboration between the Zurich Univers University of the Arts and the uh, Paul Scherer Institute. And this project will focus on um, um, anthrop uh, anthropogenic climate changes. And I would like to react on a theme that was uh, brought up already by Claudia and then Jean-Paul. This and a theme that I was very close to during my work in the museum. This, um, um, these challenges that um, we, we are confronted, or the artists are also confronted, regarding the shipment uh, of, of artworks. And of course, there's a constant pressure uh, on the artists of production. And I just recently wrote a um, very interesting um, interview with Hito Steyr, mm -hmm. and she was talking about the uh, obsession of the art world with new work, mainly for marketing reasons. Museums and galleries want to show fresh goods. And this is, of course, an attitude that is everything but uh, sustainable. So that is certainly something we need to, to work on. Thank you, Madeleine. Thank you a lot. We, we continue in Zurich with Eddie. Uh, Hedy, uh, there is a little, a big pressure, not a little, a big pressure on you because uh, you are director of Pourcent Culturel Migro from now to four. It's a long period. And uh, Pourcent Culturel Migro is the largest private cultural institution in Switzerland. Uh, in the middle of uh, art in Switzerland, we say that is the Minister of Culture is uh, Pourcent Culturel Migro. And, and, and I don't know if the, the people knows in internationally what is Poisson Cultural Migros. You, you, you need to talk about that. But when your uh, decisions are taken by a structure like Poisson Cultural Migros, the impact is very important because it's a very important structure. And uh, what is for you this, this uh, relationship between uh, a problem like uh, environment, 
and uh, this situation now, and what do you do with Migro? Thank you very much uh, also for having me uh, uh, at this talk, uh, Jean-Paul. Jean Thank you for the invitation. But so let me just um, uh, give you a, a brief idea about what we do. Um, the Migro cultural percentage is actually a voluntary initiative by Migro in the fields of culture, society, education, and uh, leisure. And the idea of the Migro cultural percentage uh, was first brought up actually by Migro founder Gottlieb Dutweiler in 1957. So we are kind of an old um, institution. What makes us quite special is that in accordance with the wishes of Gottlieb Dutweiler, Migro commits to making a yearly contribution to the Migro culture percentage, which is related and calculated on the basis on turnover. Um, and this um, makes us a solid and stable uh, founder. Uh, what is also very special is that as a corporate ob objective, the um, Migro culture percentage is placed on an equal footing with commercial success. So we are not a marketing institution, but we are uh, somehow um, independent. Now, Jean-Paul, what is the role we try uh, to play? We like uh, to see ourselves um, as a catalyst uh, that seeks to work together with other private and public um, organizations. We realize somehow our own projects, but we also provide support for projects of individuals, artists, uh, in the form, of course, of financial contributions. Um, maybe for this debate, um, I mentioned just some of our uh, many activities. You might uh, know uh, our Migro Museum for Gegenwartskunst, um, uh, which is a player for international uh, contemporary art founded in 1996. Um, and uh, when you look at the program uh, of the museum uh, right now, uh, our exhibitions last very long because they're um, not open. Uh, we have this exhibition curated by our director, Heike Munder, Potential World, Worlds. Um, and the, the exhibition actually uh, focuses on uh, the relationship between humans and nature in the light of today's ecological situation. So the consequence of environmental devastation have made it plain that we need to understand humanity to be an integral part of rather than the center of the world. And uh, the exhibition had the first chapter, um, potential words, planetary memories, turned that turned the spotlight actually on the ways in which humans took possession of the natural world in pursuit of power and resources and the repercuss repercussions uh, for nature as well as communities as uh, um, you already addressed um, before. So we have as an instrument uh, an own institution uh, where we can play this kind of topics and uh, we have also uh, different projects um, in which we try to address this topic. Maybe um, I just mentioned another new initiative of the uh, cultural percentage, um, a program called m to act um, m to act is a funding and network project um, which supports initiatives in the performing arts. And right now we're supporting an initiative called Klima Contour in Basel or another initiative called Gaststube, Homemade Climate Conference um, by a collective called uh, Gaststube. Uh, we have not enough time to go in deeper in these uh, initiatives, maybe um, later. I just wanted to add that since 2012, we have a new funding, uh, which is uh, engagement Migro, uh, which is a voluntary development of the fund of the Migro uh, group. And I had a chance to develop this uh, fund together with uh, Stefan Schöbi um, and his teams in the last uh, eight years. And there we try to support pioneers 
who want to help shape a better world, as we like uh, to say, say, or a better uh, society. And, and I just mentioned maybe uh, a project called Move the Date, uh, that is um, Move the Date Switzerland project um, that wants to postpone uh, the date uh, when the resources um, actually uh, would have been used of by the whole population uh, briefly what we do. Thank you, Eddie. Now, now I, I want we, we go in the debate for the discussion between the three points, uh, the key points, hope, future and trust. It was the choice of uh, Jessica Morgan. Exactly. So those were her ideas that came out of the 2020 summit. And she pointed three questions that we will debate in all the international debates as well. Well, the first one, hope. How can the artist take environmental issue into consideration in his work? No, I, I think uh, artists uh, artist have to address the problem of our time. And um, obviously, we cannot see a bigger problem now than the climate crisis. So besides doing art for art, as you mentioned uh, before, which is also essential, as, uh, as human, we are creating and producing um, um, artworks. And um, this is one of the beauty and pleasure in, uh, in life, I think, at least for me. Uh, besides this, it's uh, obviously so important to address those uh, problematic. So, well, I'm personally learning every day what, what can be done. And uh, as, as everyone, I think we are asking those questions also now in the debate, what can be done? It's very, it's very tricky, but uh, I think uh, young uh, artists, students from, from our school also, they, they already, I think, understood because they, they look at the news and uh, they are also part of a new generation now that, uh, that understand we have to create less waste and most of all consume less meat and if possible no meat at all for example so that's something uh, i do personally since uh, quite some time now i cannot well at the moment no one travels but uh, when things can go somehow back to normal um, shows and exhibition around the world will hopefully start again and uh, i think now we can uh, ask ourselves one more time, is this essential that uh, I will go now to install this show? I hope people will still be able to travel and, and, and still exhibition because uh, obviously a Zoom meeting cannot replace the human contact. So this is very important. But uh, it just proves me a few days ago, I installed a, a show in Berlin uh, in, my, in my gallery at Koenig and uh, we installed everything remote at, and it worked. Obviously it was sad not to see each other, but that's also possible. So yeah, having said that, it's, um, yes, yeah, something can be done in this uh, direction. So yeah, I, I think everyone needs to maybe see the priorities into their life and, and work. And for example, since I cannot cut completely the travels, I just cut the meat, which, equal somehow, you know, and um, this is for uh, many reasons, obviously the environment, but also the animals on themselves. And uh, yeah, th there are solutions and, uh, and many, many people and scientists especially worked on those and white books. And if you are interested and if you have empathy and curiosity and hope for the future, you better get informed to understand what to, what to do in your personal life. Tom, a reaction from you. You are a professor at EPFL. You work also with a lot of students. We have hope. <laughs> no, I, I mean, hope is very important. And uh, I, I think uh, hope is one of the, uh, is a very pronounced and, and um, a feature of human mankind, right? It's, it's very much uh, intrinsic to our nature. And sometimes we're losing hope a little bit. And uh, so whenever we lose hope, uh, it's good to get back to have the, the big picture, the grand picture. And uh, I, I think it's, it's important to have that 
big picture, right? And when coming to students, for instance, um, you know, to 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 convey to them, right, how things are going, etc., right? And what we are living now, or what we are going through now, that this is only part of it, right? And let's not forget the rest of the big picture, right? So for me, that's one part of the <clears throat> related to hope. For me, it's really like the, I mean, it's pleasure, right? So it's really like the pleasure that talking for myself and some of my colleagues that I, I, that I have, it's like the pleasure that we have with the work that we do in science. But for Claudia, it's the same in her studio, for instance, or in her workshop, right? It's, that's, it's so nurturing, right? And without being nurtured on a daily basis, right? Without having the big picture, right? And that's the good thing with aging, it's the wisdom, right? Uh, without that, we are lost, right? But we have it and we are privileged, right? And that's something that we have to pass over, right? And that's also what I hopefully try to be able to do when I'm as a, as a professor at EPFL and when I'm giving the class, right? When I'm explaining to the students, okay, so that's where we are, right? And that's the knowledge that we still have to, to, to get in order to be able to change something, right? And with a good word is pleasure. Pleasure. Uh, I, I come to Zurich uh, for the institution. Uh, really, can the institution promote this action or is only the surface? Madeleine. Um, also regarding your, your previous question, I think it's not so problematic if we think of the artists, what is their role, what can they do uh, regarding climate change. I think especially for a young generation, they're very much aware, I think, of many of these topics, maybe more than the older generation. And there I'm quite optimistic. And I think besides that uh, we can expect from artists that they really attack and they are aware of the crucial themes of today, they are not so much the problem. It's more the problem of the art world, or I would call it the art circus, traveling around, being present everywhere, being um, and making lots of um, trips around the world, um, uh, using um, enormous amount of resources just to, to meet up to see fresh art here and there. And the whole crowd is uh, traveling around the globe the whole time. Quickly to the role of the um, in funding um, institutions um, like Proelvetia or yeah, Migros. Don't know what um, Hedy thinks about it, but um, I would say through um, the decisions that we are taking, we can um, have quite an impact through the projects that we are promoting, through the initiatives that we are taking. We were hearing about some initiatives of Provetia or of, uh, um, um, of Migros um, um, just before. So there, I think we can um, have uh, quite an impact with our, uh, with our work. Eddie, hope is still important for you? Hope, always. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> never give up hope. No, never give up hope. But uh, so many things were said um, already. I, I want to take up maybe um, two points. Um, in this whole discussion, what I also find interesting um, it, it, is that we we are trying now to fund projects that are made in a co-creative, collaborative way, not only between artists of several disciplines, but maybe also uh, between arts and science, whatever um, you name it. And um, what for us is also important, we have changed our uh, system of funding uh, actually last year, um, and we now invest in two parts. The first one is um, actually the ideation situation. Uh, ideation where means where artists try out ideas, where they have to do research, where they have to find partners, where they have to um, be interested in, in, in collaborations. And um, money is used to be hard to find there because there is no production yet, there is no result yet, but um, there is just maybe some kind of an idea or some kind of interest in a topic. Um, and I think this might be um, also something that can make art production a bit more sustainable. 
Uh, if we speak about uh, theater, uh, for instance, you know that people they play uh, maybe in the city where they produce their piece in Switzerland, but they don't go on tour because sometimes it's too difficult. They have not enough uh, uh, funding. So we have this ideation part and we have the diffusion, diff diffusion part. We're only working in Switzerland. So, and I am also very fond of this uh, newer generations um, that uh, think without borders and without uh, out of their own discipline also. And I see a lot of energy uh, there. We are going to launch a project during uh, this year for um, the next generation. I don't know the title of the project yet, but it's also it will also be a very collaborative uh, project. Uh, it was mentioned that uh, yes, people want to see new work all the time, but uh, we invest really um, in the productions um, and then we buy also these works for our collection. So we have the whole circle. Uh, these pieces, some of them, of course, they also go elsewhere, but we try to produce art and also integrate it in our collection. But we can do it, uh, of course, because we are a private uh, institution with uh, a lot of freedom also. And freedom is always hope. Yeah, thank you, Eddie. Can I add something? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, the discussion that uh, we are having now, uh, so it turns a little bit around the uh, question how to get the art out of the studio, right? Uh, so, you, Madeleine, you mentioned the art circus, etc. And so there are beautiful parallels, again, to the world that I'm coming from, so the science and the research, right? So we calling this dissemination, right? And uh, so uh, ironically, or as absurd as it is, before COVID-19, there were huge international conferences on an annual basis, right? For instance, on climate change. So guess what, right? There were thousands of people traveling to San Francisco, traveling to Tokyo, traveling to wherever around the world to take part to these uh, conferences, right? So this in itself is kind of absurd, right? And I, I, I do think, even with some hope perhaps, that this, uh, once we uh, uh, were able to overcome the pandemics, that this will change uh, the way scientists are going to meet in the future to exchange, for instance. May I just add, uh, Tom, to this topic? Uh, I found it interesting because um, my resources don't allow me to travel a lot uh, and to, to be part of this uh, whatever uh, called uh, circus. So um, globe, on a global level, I was really missing everything. But since the pandemic, I have access. Um, lately, yeah. uh, I was part of a discussion with people in India and in, in, in San Francisco. And, and I was like, whoa, finally. Yeah. I get access to this and before I, I didn't have it and it was not only because we didn't know how to use technology it was as you said because the circus is very close and you have to meet there and you have to go there yeah. well I, I will continue because time passes and there is three points I, I go to the with you Tom to the second point we will talk after hope about future and the, I don't know if there is the same hope for the future can we be inspired by the past, or should we reconsider the future as a world? You, you, the time is very large for scientists. It's not just today and tomorrow. What do you think about that? So first of all, perhaps we have to be aware of like what we call legacies or memory effects, right? And this is, of course, the link in time uh, between the past, the now, and the future. Right. So there can't be any now, there, will, there won't be any future without the now or the past, respectively. Right? And this is even encoded in our genes. Right? So there we call this like inherited traits or whatever. Right? So we, we, we carry the past with us all the time. And so do ecosystems, for instance. So does the environment. Right? And this is a pretty new way of uh, thinking and trying to understand how the environment works. So today we think that the environment does have, does have an, a memory from past environmental events, for instance, right? So 
I mean, just to, to close this parenthesis, perhaps, right, let's even not think that there will be a future, <laughs> right, uh, uh, without considering uh, what we are doing now, right, or what, hap what has happened uh, in the past, right? So now, um, <clears throat> during these discussions, um, you know, we were kind of hoovering a little bit around the topic of the, what we call the Anthropocene, right? And I mean, the Anthropocene, there has been, and it's still ongoing, a debate uh, in the science community if we should even give a new, this name to a new uh, era or to a new epoch, right? Because before it was the Holocene, etc., etc. So these were times in Earth's history uh, that were mostly shaped by geological processes or by geophysical processes, right? And now humans, we have taken over, right? We have, we, we, we have overwhelmed the, the strength, the power of these processes, right? And this will have a huge, huge legacy for the next, for, for, for hundreds of years. So whatever we do today, right, will have repercussions to what happens tomorrow and the day tomorrow, etc. Future or no future? Well, there's always a future. There's always a future. And I mean, just to tell you, I mean, that's also what I try to uh, <coughs> convey to the students. May not be our future. But it may be the future of some animals, maybe the future of some plants, right? It definitely is the future of microorganisms. Right? And we, we don't accept the fact right, that we are part of universal natural laws. Right? And our body, for instance, is something like 70% water. Right? So to nurture this body, we need clean water. We need clean air to breathe. Right? So these are universal laws. Right? Whatever we do, the more we deteriorate our environment, the more energy we would have to spend right, to get from somewhere clean water, right, to get from somewhere clean air. Right? So it's becoming a vicious circle. Right? And we have to get out of that vicious circle. And probably the best solution to get out there, science and research do know enough. We do know, we do understand the causes, right? Why we arrived where we are, right? We do understand that why we have a climate warming or a global warming. We do understand this. It's now time to act, right? And I think the only way to get out of that vicious circle is to stop worshipping the indefinite economical growth Right? Yeah. We ha it's time to kind of get from quantity to quality, right? And, you know, getting to quality, right? To sustainability, right? This will again uh, kind of um, stimulate, right? You know, new areas that do help with economical growth, right? But there's what we call in ecology a carrying capacity. It's a plafond, it's a ceiling, right? Yeah. And there's no way to get through that one. These are the so-called planetary boundaries. We have boundaries, right? And for some of them, we are way behind them already. Claudia, I, I will come to you for this point. Uh, can you evoke your residency in uh, Yekaterinburg in, uh, about legacy? In, uh, it was in uh, 2015. It, it was very fascinating for, for me to, to understand that um, trees um, have in their very own body all those uh, information. And by this, by recreating this, uh, this climate, looking at those, those rings, um, yeah, I found it fascinating that I myself work with, with wood that is from our time, obviously, the, the wood that we were um, that we were uh, analyzing uh, at the time during, at the Ural Mountains were wood that were uh, kept into the permafrost, so wood trees that uh, lived long, long ago. And um, yeah, the story somehow is, uh, is, is repeating uh, on itself. Are we doing enough 
and not think, or should we do more? What do you think, Eddie? You have trust on the future? Of course, we should always do more. <laughs> But uh, the question for me is, do we the right thing, considering the right options? Um, uh, and I would start from a bit an image. Uh, what is the society um, in which we want to live in the future, in a society, a world that is good for future uh, generations? And what can we do today to make this future world, even if we don't know how it looks, um, a, a livable world? Um, of course, we have um, ecology, but we have also aspects of diversity. Uh, we have uh, different aspects we have to, uh, to consider. And um, it's all on a hypothesis now. But I think we have really to listen carefully And Tom said also the changes now uh, we have with uh, COVID, uh, with the COVID, uh, pandemic situation. Um, I think we never do enough, but we have to be totally aware that we don't know what is right, that it's an experiment and that we have to be open for this experiment. And um, that's also open end, of course. Um, and uh, I think that we have also to be able to to trust somehow in a situation where we don't know the end, but where we see where parameters are and we should stop investing there um, where it doesn't make sense, where um, uh, maybe things um, have seen their time and they're not uh, relevant for the future. And this mostly hurts because we're all part of generations Uh, that we're used to having a certain amount of uh, uh, things, also life standards maybe uh, in certain countries for certain persons. Um, uh, I think we have to, to go into uh, radical change uh, also on an economic uh, uh, level. And uh, But yes, I, I think we, we have to do many things, but uh, we have also to trust um, the experiment Uh, we have to trust also chance is also important. Uh, uh, also in art and in science, uh, sometimes chance uh, happens and uh, maybe uh, this also makes uh, uh, solutions for further uh, generations also uh, somehow possible. Madeleine, uh, Prodesia is in a public institution in direct relationship with the state, with the, the Conseil Federal and the Parliament. Do you trust in the politician, in the decision of the politician for your work and for the artist and for the future? I think one theme, of course, is the sustainability. And uh, we were mentioning before, um, how can we learn from the past? And I think we certainly can learn from the past especially our generation, because when it comes to ecological question, every generation before us did better than, than we did. So we can always learn uh, from our grandparents already. And um, so this um, sharing um, quality uh, or a sharing um, culture or a reused culture, these are um, themes that are um, quite Prominent, uh, prominently used in cultural art scene and I think uh, promising. But um, of course we have, um, what was his difficulty is that this economic aims on a political um, level now that you were um, referring to as well, are often, or, or people think they are in conflict with um, ecological goals. And that is kind of a main, um, main problem. And I think we have to work around this. We need to bring these together. If they're in a, in a conflict then we can't go on and then we're always a bit slow or too slow also. I mean, because um, yeah, they're, we're already behind. So we, we need to, need to uh, act now or we would have needed to act yesterday already. So. Thank you, Eddie, Madeleine, Claudia, and Tom, and Lick for the invitation. It was beautiful. 
Thank you very much. It was great. Thank, Thank you. you.